Ladies and gentlemen, we're back, Matchroom Radio with David Diamante, episode 77. Um, we're here in the steel city of Sheffield, England. And today I have a, a really incredible guest. Um, he's also a buddy of mine, and I'm really proud to have Jacob Stitch Duran. Uh, welcome to the podcast, buddy. Man, I'm so proud of you, bro. Look at you. <laughs> I, knew, you. I, I, knew, I knew you win. <laughs> you too, so, man. Yeah, you too. Thank it's, you, man. It's, we've both been blessed. We yeah. really have, man. So it's, it's been a blessing, man. So. It's been a great ride, and um, we get to see each other all over the world Yeah, for years yeah. and um, work the fights, work movies, yeah. all kinds of great stuff. Um, look, people, most people out there know who you are. They say, Stitch, he's the greatest cut man. And, he wraps hands, but I don't know how many people actually know about you and your background because you really go deep. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's just, I guess, start a little bit from there. Um, born in 19, 1951? 1951, yeah. California, Planada? Yeah, well, Planada was a town I moved to when I was born and raised in a migrant camp. Okay. Uh, six miles away from Planada. Uh, my birth certificate is, uh, for the address, is CPC number 12. San Joaquin California, Valley? Yeah, California Packing Company, number 12. And uh, I was in second grade. My parents had enough money to buy a house in Panada. And uh, that's where I grew up, and that's my pride and joy. How many brothers and sisters? There's eight all together. You know, there's five boys, three girls, and, you know, we've all been through the trenches, and we all came out successful just uh, because of the work ethics that our parents gave us, you know, to, to work hard, to be fair, and to help people. And uh, that's, that's always been our nature, David. You know, tell me about Cesar Chavez and his struggle and how that affected you and, and the people around you. Yeah, Cesar Chavez, I guess I could best describe him. He was our Martin Luther King, you know. Uh, working the fields, we had nothing. We all drank out of the same metal can, the same tin cup, you know. Uh, pesticides, they were spraying films of the fields. And, you know, I tell people I have enough pesticides in me that mosquitoes don't even bother us anymore. <laughs> so, so there was, you know, our, my mom and dad, my mom, my sisters, you know, work in the fields. They would have to literally go down to the bottom of the crops and go to the bathroom there. And there was, there was nothing. So Cesar Chavez is the one that went forward and, and uh, required fair practices for us. Simple things, restrooms, uh, drinking waters, you know pesticides and all that that was the uh, so I remember I was like 12 13 years old and the famous walk from Delano to Sacramento the state sure. capital they walked through our little town Planada and uh, they spend the night and uh, our families put them up and washed their clothes and fed them and all that and my sister Linda and my mom continued to walk with them and uh, so yeah he was uh, he was a guy that kind of represented us and uh, you know, got me where I am today and made me the the, the face of the rebellion because I speak out now for the fighters and uh, only because we have been taken advantage of and nothing has really ha happened within the industry, uh, insurances, pension plans and all that. Uh, so that's been my mission. It's almost like a coaching tree. It, 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 a great coach, you know, goes on and teaches guys and that's, you know, yeah. you, you're saying it, you learn from him, yeah. you know, the struggle of the people and the farm workers back then. And now you're taking it to the fighters. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I never knew, you know, that what, what I was doing was doing what he did. Yeah. You know, but I was just looking for the right things because when I got into this game, David, I, I saw so many unfair practices. You know, fighters with dementia, pugilistica, no contracts, uh, mm -hmm. uh, no management, you know, no pension plan, no insurance. And uh, we got about 23 years ago, I uh, did an interview on educating, wrapping hands, and this young kid, John Bartonhouse. I just graduated from uh, the American Film Institute. And he contacted me and says, hey man, I just graduated and I'd like to help you. And uh, so from doing that, we ended up uh, getting so many interviews. We put a film together called Boxer's Nightmare. And it deals with all the issues that are happening. And uh, we never did nothing with it. I knew nothing about film. He was a young kid. So we just kind of put it on the shelf. Well, John passed away about a year ago. And it's been over 20 years since I've seen this film. And I looked at it and I'm thinking, wow, give me chills right now. Everybody that I have in there are all Hall of Famers. Some are already dead. I got Mike Tyson before he got his tattoo, Eddie Mustafa Muhammad, Fernando Vargas, Mills Lane, Joe Cortez, Richard Steele, Emmanuel Stewart, Chuck Boda, Miguel Diaz, Dr. Hermansky, Dr. Goodman, uh, Rolando Ariano. We talked about all the issues that were happening in boxing. And as I looked at this film, David, I'm thinking, wow, now it affects MMA. 
same thing. They're getting screwed like these guys were getting screwed. Nothing's ever been done. So uh, at the end of this, I'll send it to you. I want you to look at it because I want to bring this out. I, now I want to get current interviews with MMA fighters and, mm. and find out how come nothing's ever been done. So I, I looked at this film and I'm thinking, wow, I have been fighting for the rights of people not even knowing. And then the UFC let me go because I spoke out about the Reebok deal. Uh, but that gave me the fade, put me the, made me the Cesar Chavez of, of combat sports. So proud of doing what I do, you know. And speaking of films, you got your own film coming out. Yeah, that's, you know, I've been blessed with so many, so many things. And, you know, to this day, David, I've never asked for one job, which is that proud Chicano, you know. And uh, things have happened. I've been to seven movies. <laughs> the, the first one I got was uh, with Woody Harrelson and Antonio Banderas. Uh, okay. here, I played to the bone. Uh -huh. I was Woody's cut man. I wanted to be with Antonio Banderas, right? Because he's Latino, I'm Latino. And, but Chuck Bodak, my mentor, <laughs> got in front of me. Right, so right. I ended up with Woody Harrelson. But in that movie, he's the one that got cut. He's the one, I got the accolades. Oh, don't worry, you got the best cut man in boxing. In it. So that was my first one. And then I did Ocean's Eleven when Lennox Lewis fought Vladimir Klitschko. And uh, I had met Klitschko's in 1991 in Kiev. When the Soviet Union broke, we took a team of professional boxers and kickboxers to Kiev to fight them. And they were already young stars. But after that movie, Emmanuel Stewart was commentating for HBO. And, you know, we're watching fans go into the MGM for the fights. And Emmanuel has his tuxedo and he says, I want to talk to you about Vladimir. He goes like this. And I'm talking to my friend. And I said, wow. Next day he says, Vladimir wants you to be his cup man. I was with him for eight years, you know, and, and you uh, guys had not just Vladimir, but also Vitaly and, and Vitaly. Had, yeah, you yeah, guys yeah. had a real, real, yeah. very close relationship. Yeah, and uh, you know, yeah. So I did that, and then I did Balboa when Rocky fought his last fight. I turned it down. Joe Cortez called me and, and from the uh, fair. Uh, yeah, fair yeah. The firm. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, fair the firm. He called me and and offered me an opportunity, but at that time I was working with Fabrice Diozo out of France, he was defending his world title in Paris. And the week later, I was gonna work with Ali Harrison. So I was thinking economics, right? And I called my wife, I said, God, I got offered this opportunity, but I turned it down. She goes, are you crazy? I said, Rocky is an American icon, you right. have to do it. Absolutely. And I thought about it. And at that point, I was already negotiating with Ali Harris's people and I deleted it. And I said, look, I hope you guys understand between now and then, so and so, and they understood. So I got that Balboa, you know, and then, uh, I did one with Kevin James and Selma Hyatt. That's the one you uh, slapped him. Yeah, what happened there? What happened there? <laughs> hey, <laughs> what happened, like a well, baby. Well, well, what happened there <laughs> is in movies when you have lines, you get residuals, right? And there was no lines. I got the script and there was no lines. I got, I got to think of something. But when it was time for us to do, I see with Kevin James. Well, you, put, you said something like, welcome to the UFC. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. You, what did you say? Yeah, so, yeah. Well, he, he said, hey, we, we got to have you say something, right? <laughs> So I thought about this two weeks before, but right, I right, said, well, you know, I always tell the guys, welcome to the UFC. Right. So, ah, oh, he loved it, man. So the time that he calls me in and, oh, Stitch, I can't believe you're working on me, big fan of it. And I'm working on him like this. And I go, Shh, shh, well, welcome to the UFC. <laughs> and I walk yeah. off. He didn't know I was going to slap him, right? right, right. Uh, that's one take. I and, and I got my residuals from that. And then, uh, yeah, the Creed 1, Creed 2, and Creed 3. And we were in Creed 3 together. Oh, you what, know? A, what so, a blast that was. Yeah, man. it's been a blessing. And I just... I just got a pension from them. You know, I'm a zero actor, bro. You know, I know nothing about acting. I don't want to be an actor, but I got a pension from them. It's great. So I've been blessed. But, but I, I, I think that I've heard you say that you would like to, if you could get another role that's not in the cup, man, you yeah, would do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, at first I was telling this, you know, I could be a gangster. I could be mafioso. I could be so-and-so. And, -so, and sure, the guy sure. says, this one guy, a reporter says, why don't you become a, a teacher? Why don't you become an educator? Why don't you become something on the positive note, right? Yeah, but just one time. Just to say I did it outside of being myself. But you know, Stitch, this is the thing about you. You, you are a man that wears many hats and you are on a positive tip always. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I love you so much. And not just a great cut man, but an incredible hand wrapper, which is a, th these are both, both of these two things are complete arts yeah. and they're very important in the fight game, especially when you get to the very high levels of the sport. Um, so, but it's a lot to talk about because I, I want to yeah. talk about that more, but let's kind of follow with the story. So n then you went to the military. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So and, I, and this is how you got into the fight game, right? It was in yes, Thailand and kickboxing. Yes, and yes. tell us about this. Well, you know, my, my goal, my dream, as I was a farm worker, I mean, I would be picking peaches and nectarines, and baseball was what I was good at. You know, I played four years of varsity ball in Ligre and I, and uh, I walked on to a college, Merced College, uh, which was nine miles away from Planada. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but I didn't have a car. So I would go to school with friends and uh, after school they would leave and I'd stay and I'd practice and I'd have to do this. And you know, I didn't know about grants, I didn't know about scholarships, just real naive. Uh, so I went to the recruiter and uh, I joined the Air Force in 1972. And I told myself if I ever went to the Orient, I'd want to study the martial arts. This was during the Bruce Lee era. And uh, they sent me to a place called Thailand. Bro, I didn't even know what Thailand was, you know. But I, the Marine recruiter tried to get me in. I said, man, I don't want to go to Vietnam. Well, I land in Thailand, it's like four in the morning and all these Jeeps come in with 60 calibers on, uh, mounted and they got towers and guns and, and I think, man, what am I doing here? Right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I had friends who were already stationed there and they invited me downtown to Banchan to look at some Muay Thai fights and I didn't know what Muay Thai fights were. The guy knocked, threw a kick and knocked the guy out and I said, boom, I'm in. So that next Monday on the base, they had, for the GIs, they had Taekwondo. Well, Taekwondo, Thailand to me sounds the same. There was a Korean art. And uh, we did that for about three months. And uh, the Thais, they left, the Thais took over and they transitioned us, still kept that, that Taekwondo name because that was our contract. But they transitioned us into the Muay Thai system. And that one year I ate, drank and slept martial arts. Had lunch with monks and went into the jungles and just kind of, like you went to Africa, I went into the jungles in, in Thailand and got back to the States and uh, got into boxing to improve my hands. And uh, King's Gym, I was their first student. 15 bucks. I used, to, I used to train at Kings. Yeah, 15, 15 bucks, man. Yeah. I, uh, Charles King, were, they, were, they were putting up a mirror and I'd go by and I'd check every day. And so I started training with Pete Alvarado, uh, working with amateur boxers. And we created the first two champions out of King's Gym. And then I moved out to the suburbs Fairfield. And uh, there, as crazy as I was, I opened up a school of kickboxing with a credit card. You know, my wife supported me, my family supported me, but I was already recognized as the top trainer sure. in kickboxing. And uh, so that was successful, And uh, but my dream was to go to Vegas. And uh, I put in for a job transfer. I worked for RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company for 23 years. So I was at the corporate status with them and uh, I waited and I waited and I had my school of kickboxing, right? And uh, get a call. They said, hey man, there's an opening in Las Vegas. But you gotta be there in a week. <laughs> I said, man, I can't. You know, I, I talked to the manager and he gave me two weeks. I swear to God, David, I transferred my school to a student, Randy Bussart. I sold my house, I took a loss. I put my family in a U-Haul and we drove for nine hours to Las Vegas uh, to follow my dreams. What year was this? Don't ask me about years, man. It's been, I've been 29 I'll, years already, I'll almost 30 years. I'll tell you, yeah. I, I remember Vegas back then. Yeah. And I was living in California yeah. many years ago also. Yeah. And uh, Vegas was a different beast back then. Yeah. It was wide open, man. Wide open. It's really come up. It's like now it's the, it's the entertainment capital. It's yeah. it's just big time. But it, back then it was like it was just property was cheap. Yeah. Food was cheap. Yeah. It was just wide open, man. Yeah. Yeah. The dollar uh, shrimp cocktails. You remember all this? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. They just wanted you in there, man. Yeah. They yeah. Just so wanted you yeah. In there. So I went there to follow my dreams, and then it was only boxing. But I, so I have a question <clears> though, because because you were. You know, your training, you worn a lot of hats in the fight game. Mm -hmm. What made you want to be a cut man? I mean, that's like such a niche specific thing. Yeah. And what is it about that that, that appealed to you? Well, you know, good question. I, I was a trainer first and I had to learn all aspects. I had my own school of kickboxing and I had my own, my own gym and uh, I was a trainer. I was a manager. I promoted kickboxing fights, but I had to learn to be a cut man. And I remember, I never forget, I, Marvis Frazier fought Bone Crusher Smith Fuck in Marvis. Richmond, California. Yeah. And I was learning to be a cut man. And that time it was boxing only. Well, this one guy did a good job. And I went up to him, I said, hey man, you know, I'm trying to learn to be a cut man. Can you tell me what you did? He says, fuck you, I'm taking this to my grave and you gotta learn like me and he walked away. Right, right, right. I felt about this big, David, because yeah. I'm never gonna be like this man. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, that was the start. But, yeah, I learned to be a cut man just by watching because nobody in boxing would not show you no school their, their, their secrets, quote unquote. Uh, but there was no secrets. It's all proper application. So I studied it and, you know, I was already a top level cut man in kickboxing worldwide. So I made the move to Vegas to be a cut man. And yeah, here I am talking to you. And, you know, we've we've talked, we've spent a lot of time together. Yeah. We've, we've talked about a lot of stuff, especially about what you do and about the industry there's a lot of stuff i know you take it so serious even mm -hmm. you've created your own end swell it's not even called an end swell anymore what's it's it called? it's kale swell my wife swell. charlotte called it but that. it makes sense yeah you know when 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 you have an end swell and you're trying to stop the the, the swelling 
that it's usually this area or this area, and it's curved. So tell us the story how you came up. Oh, no, you've that. been doing your homework, huh? Well, no, I, I remember. Yeah, yeah. You talked about. So, yeah, so yeah. I, I was coming back from England uh, in the UFC, and we're at the airport, and uh, she said, "Well, I'll get the water." I'm like this with Kenny Florian, and we're there, and I'm like this, and see how it's curved, and I think, "Wow, you know, all the irons, the kales, or the end swells were all flat." But I thought about it because all the majority of the swelling is here and here. Right. So I went home and I got some clay and I made a little sample and I got my first uh, kale swell and and yeah, I made it because and, and and I'll tell you why because there's so many myths and so many mistakes that guys are doing even now in boxing I'm and sure. MMA. So you see guys that are doing this with the end swell and what they're doing, creating, they're they're creating more damage. Creating more so in I mean, how many times you get cut? and you put pressure, blood coagulates itself. If you help it, cold, direct pressure. Right. So that's why I created it. And, uh, you know, I've used it. Got my own line of tape, and, you know. And, and then there's guys with the, the swabs in their mouth, oh, God, behind yes. the ear. Yeah. What's that's, your take on this? That's, that's horrible. You know, my, my, kids know <laughs> my, my kids know the game. They'll call me, Dad, did you see <laughs> Dad, this, this and that. But I, uh, that's another thing. If you notice the new generation of cut men now, they wear gloves. Right. Uh, they have the, the wrist wrap sure. that uh, we have swabs in there. Right, right. Uh, they put the Vaseline here. Sure. They got small towels instead of big old towels. Right. Uh, they follow the techniques that I use. That's the new technique. That, and that's the best way to work a cut in the short period amount of time that you have. Very simple. It's not that hard. Because really, at the end of the day, you have about 50 seconds, I would say. Maximum. To, I mean, it's almost like a pit, like a pit stop yeah. of a driver. I mean, the, the, the car comes in, it's, yeah. beep, 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 beep. you know, whatever has to be done, that's you, Yeah. you know? Yeah. So when you're doing a fight, I mean, are you, obviously you're watching the fight, but are you more watching for damage or are you kind of watching the fight in general? Is it, is it like, if, for example, I talk to some judges mm -hmm. sometimes, I talk to a lot of judges and a lot of them say like after a fight, they have to go back and rewatch the fight for enjoyment because yeah. during the fight, they're literally just watching for you know, yeah. for, for punches and this and that and the other. Are you watching for enjoyment too? Or are you really just watching for the face? Yeah, both. You know, I, um, I'm, I'm definitely the face is a priority, uh, you know, techniques and swelling and all that. But I'm also looking at who's winning the round and who's losing the round. Sure. And, and a good example, the first time I worked with uh, uh, Vladimir Klitschko when he fought um, Darryl, uh, Devero Williamson, uh, he had just lost his world title to Lehman Brewster. And this was at Caesars Palace. And, uh, he ends up with a big old cut right here. And I've worked on those cuts before, that big vein you have. Sure. Very, very hard to bleed, to stop. And at that point, he had won the first three rounds. And then the fourth round, he gets dropped. You know, but okay, still ahead. The fifth round, the unintentional headbutt. So I know that it could go to the scorecards. And I told him and Vitaly as they sat down, I said, look. You're winning you, this you, fight. Yeah, you, you got a bad cut. You're winning this fight. I'm going to have the doctor stop the fight. So when Dr. Goodman came in, and I've worked with her many, many times. She goes, what do you think, Stitch? I opened the cut up. You I said, yeah, it's, it. it's, it's pretty bad, and stopped the fight. And Emmanuel Stewart didn't even know, because I was, you know, I whispered to them. You know. It went to the scorecards, and he ended up winning the fight and became world champion right after that. So Jay Nady calls me, or I see him a couple of shows later. He says, Stitch, come here. Did you do what I thought you did? Did you open up that cut? Because <laughs> he knew. Uh, yeah. He knew it was he right go, on the scorecards. He goes, that was, that was ingenious, yeah. you know. But Dr. Goodman had called the next day, and she says, it's a good thing you stopped the fight when you did because the surgeon says it was close to an optical nerve and Vladimir would have received double vision. Sure. So. No, it, it turned out to be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, obviously if it's an unintentional headbutt, you got to watch to make sure the referee calls it that and it's called that. Yes. Because if not, it could be, it could be a technical knockout. Right, you exactly, yeah. 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 So, so you got to know the game. You have to know the game. Yeah. It's extremely important. Now, let's talk about the hands. Yeah. These are, you know, it's funny. We, we've got airplanes, and iPhones that do everything, yeah. Ferraris, incredible machines. Yeah. But our bodies are probably the most incredible machine that there is. And the hand, what a what a feature this is with all yeah. these bones. Wrapping a hand is so important. Protecting, I mean, this is what a fight, it's like if you're a, if you're an artist, it's your hands, if you're, yes. you know, what, what, these are the, the, the tools of the trade for a fighter. 100%. So tell me about your hand wrapping Techniques, uh, techniques, yeah. and, and kind of how it started. Uh, and well, once again, you know, uh, when I was had my school of kickboxing, I'd be in the in the back room looking at these trainers, boxing trainers, wrapping hands, and I'd look at their styles, and 
Uh, but I'd go home and practice my own. And I'd different techniques and I'd get on the bag and, you know, try them out. And, and I remember there's a, there's a cut right here, a little cut right here. I'm at home by myself and I'm cutting them off and I'm going like this and my skin turns and I take about this much off. <laughs> it kind of freaked me out, right? And I thought, wow, freaked me out. Well, I went to the refrigerator and I got my adrenaline chloride 1-1000 and I applied it on there. <laughs> so this was, a, this was a sign from God, right? <laughs> right. And uh, so yeah, I perfected the, the wrap, but you're right. You know, the, the importance of, of, of getting a, a proper hand wrap because these, these are your bread and butters. It's your bread and, and butter. But not only that, it's a confidence builder. Huge. When, when you go up there and, yeah. and you wrap these guys' hands like Chon, Chon Cepeda. Yeah. You know, when I wrapped his hands the first time, his, you could just see his enthusiasm go up. Absolutely. And so, he has a lot of knockouts. And he has a lot of knockouts. He's a puncher. Yeah. yeah. He's a puncher. So, because the hand has so many so bones. So many. Yes. They're so tiny. And, you know, ask any fight. A lot of fighters have had problems with their hands. Well, the, the metal carpals right here. Yeah, Look at that. It's, That's it's, number one injury. And, and people think that the, the, the knuckles, knuckles, but yeah, how many times you go out and get drunk and you hit a wall oh, and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. they, they have a lot of their own self-absorption. Sure. But the, the metacarpal, the wrist, the thumb, those are areas you got to protect, yep. you know, and, and still make it comfortable for the fighter. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, I mean, to have a, a, a guy like you or, or a specialist in both hand wrapping and cuts, it's, it's priceless yeah. when you get to the, the high level of the game. Because, I mean, a, a cut man can, hopefully, they don't need you. Yeah. And sometimes that happens. But when they do, you're like a fireman. When, when, when you need a fireman, you better hope yeah. he's there. Well, I'm more like an insurance agent. Or an insurance <laughs> yeah, right? agent, yeah, exactly. You know, if, That's true. You know right. if, if you're driving a Ferrari, you're not going to you know, you're not gonna get a low-level insurance policy, right? Right, right. And, uh, but yeah, but it's a confidence level. That's exactly you right. You know, uh, I'll give you another story with Vladimir Klitschko when he fought Anthony Joshua, his last fight at Wembley Stadium. I didn't see Vladimir and Vitaly till the weigh-ins in the dressing room because my daughter Carla had gotten married in Crete Wednesday, so Thursday I flew to London. Uh, but I'm talking to Vladimir and Vitaly like this, you know, and I know these guys, you know, the night before they can't sleep. So I said, Vladimir, don't worry about nothing tomorrow. I'm gonna take care of you like you're my son, and I leave. Make him give him that confidence. Yes. Yeah, so here I am, right before Michael Buffer does the announcements. I'm putting the final Vaseline on Vladimir. We're this far apart, and he says, "You could call me son." Bro, I knew I got into his mind. That's great. And, and last time I saw him uh, was in Germany, like three months later. And I asked Vladimir that moment, why? He says, Stitch, there's very few people I trust in my life. You are one of them. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, man. Yeah. You know, those deep. are moments. Yeah, it's deep. No, it's, it's yeah. really deep. And, and the connection with the fighters, I think, is one of the, one of the deepest things. They have to trust you. 100%. That you know what you're doing, that you're, you're watching, because there's a lot of things that can transpire in a fight. A hundred percent, man. And, yeah. <clears throat> Marco Antonio Barrera did a podcast with him. Great fighter out of Mexico City. Of course. And uh, he asked me a question that's never been asked before. He says, has a fighter ever disrespected you? And I thought, no, you know, because I come in under a different circumstance. Of course. I come in to take care of you. Of course. You know, and like I tell these guys, look, you know, I'm going to treat you like you're my son. Psychology, bro. Everything yeah. is psychology because these guys, they're modern day gladiators, but deep inside they're all babies. Yeah, no, sure. You know, Tyson you Fury. When I worked with Tyson the first time, you know, after he got his cuts and all that, I said, look, I'm not going to wait to you. I'm going to keep ice on you every round. I'm going to do a lot of preventing maintenance. So at the end of the fight, he wins. He has a short time. He's going to get ready to go take a shower. I'm taking off and he gives me a kiss and says, this, I love you. Thanks for keeping ice on me. Something as simple as that. Yeah. You know, but I understand. That's another thing that you do, like talking about the ice. Like you're, this is something that I, I don't think a lot of people don't see. It's, it's almost like you talk about baseball. Mm -hmm. There's small things in baseball that a lot of people miss. Yeah. That's why a lot of people don't like the game. Ah, oh, this is boring. But if they, if you know all the little signs that are happening and the little shifts, and yeah. it's incredibly exciting. And in boxing too, something as small as you with the preventative yeah. end swell or the KO swell, yeah. you know, even before, the, the swelling starts. You do things like this. I see it. Yeah. It's really incredible. Doesn't it make sense though? It makes perfect <laughs> sense. It makes perfect sense. <clears throat> it's not, it, you know, what I do is not that hard if you know what you're doing. But I also tell young kids, I, I try to educate. You know, that's my whole mission is how do I want my legacy to end? Sure. That it made this game a lot safer. But I'll tell these young kids, I said, look, if you're looking for a cut man, ask him what the adrenaline chloride 1 1000 does. That's the major medication that we use on the swabs. And if the guy says, well, it's a coagulant, 
get another cut man. Right. Because it's a vessel constrictor. Sure, sure. As you see me, as when I work difference. on cuts, I'll squeeze and I'll take that little blood out of the veins right. and then I'll put the adrenaline and it absorbs into the vessels and it closes them up. And then I also say if, if your cut man puts a swab in his mouth or his ear, like you mentioned earlier, get another cut man. That's old school. This is another thing that I think a lot of people don't, don't understand about your job what makes it so difficult. So you, like me, we're, we're, we're all over the world yeah. all the time. I see you in so many places, yeah. you know. I'm always like, oh, Stitch, what's up, man? Yeah, and I, uh, and I, tell, I, tell, I tell Stitch, like, my girl just called. My girl loves Stitch. Every yeah. time we, we call and I put <laughs> Stitch, she's like, Stitch, you know. Yeah. She loves this guy. But each commission around the world, and even in America, they have different rules for yeah. what you can have in your kit, and you got to have a fresh, uh, fresh bottles of, of certain stuff. Talk about that and how you deal with that, because that's got to be really difficult. You got to really be up on the game. Yeah, it is, you know, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the guys that are running commissions don't really understand the game, right? And and I understand their their the thing of keeping an eye and controlling everything. Uh, but yeah, I always have. They always like in New York, uh, even California, they'll check the expiration date of the adrenaline chloride, you know. And to me, I have one multiple bottles. I'll show them a clear one. It's boom, boom, here it is. You know, I, I do everything by the book. Sure. I'm not one to take any, cut any corners and all that. But I understand, you know, I understand that what they do is to protect the fighters. Of course. And I'm with it. But each commission, like, you have to really be up on where you're going and yeah. know the rules. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like here, we're in the UK, and I think for championship fights, they'll supply the adrenaline. In Germany, they'll supply the adrenaline, uh, which is good, you know, because that way you know it's it's proven and it's they're giving it to you uh, with you know, nothing that's inside but adrenaline. So let's go back to Thailand just for a second because I know you have a new venture coming out that's mm -hmm. quite exciting. And when we were when we were young, well, he, he's a little bit older than me. He got 72. 20, he got 20 years on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can be you got 20 years on me. Yeah. But when I was a kid, if you were smoking marijuana, there was a certain type called Thai stick yeah. and knocked you on your ass. It was some of the best out there. So... When you were in Thailand, you got to experience that yourself, yes? Yeah, 100%. So now you're coming out with your own line of CBD stuff and, and marijuana? Yeah, yeah. And it's called Thai Stitch? Yeah. That's after the Thai stick. Yes, know? yes. I, uh, <laughs> I the, the, the people that make for Snoop Dogg and Alton John, they contacted me. And, you know, I'm the kind of guy that uh, I'll venture into anything, right? But I told them, I said, look, the, the best weed I ever smoked was a year I was stationed in Thailand, Thai stick. If you could create something as good as that, we'll call it Thai Stitch. So that's coming out in, in June. And, uh, you know, just, just to, on the marketing aspect, because I consider myself a marketing savant, maximum exposure at a minimal cost. I'm going to do it during the UFC when they have their UFC fight week. And I'm going to, all these fans that are still my fans, I'm going to bring them to the uh, opening at Planet 13, which is the biggest dispensary in the world. There you go. So, yeah, I've been blessed with that. And, and the Cut Cream uh, company contacted me. Uh, it's a CBD product with vegetable stem cell and collagen and aloe vera and, and uh, vitamin E. And they asked me if uh, I could use it. And I said, well, what proof source do you have? I said, well, that's what we called you. So I started taking them to the bare knuckle fights, using it on them. And, and um, guys would get cut and they sew them up in the dressing room. I'd take a picture, give them the cream. And a week later, they would send me the results. And results have been excellent. So, you know, we've done that for about two, three years. And now this one company that's handling the... Uh, the herb with me, they also distribute CBD products. And uh, so that's coming out uh, uh, May the, the 3rd uh, when Canelo fights that weekend at Planet 13. It's going to be huge. Well, it's, 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 you know, it's all for the safety of fighters, taking care of fighters. Not only fighters, but if it works for fighters, it'll work for people with surgeries. And my brother had surgery and, you know, I'll show the, the results, you know, when we're done and it works. And that's, and if it didn't work, I wouldn't use it. Yeah. So. Good stuff. So, um, just going back to fighters, I mean, you've worked, let's just go down through some of the list of these guys you've worked with. Just some people out there, if they, if they maybe they're not familiar with you, some of the legends that you've worked with oh, over the years I, uh, in, in both mixed martial arts and in, uh, yeah. in boxing. Yeah, well, mixed martial arts, Dennis Alexio was the best athlete I ever met in my life. He was a world champion from light heavyweight, cruiserweight, all the way to heavyweight. That was a kickboxing at that time uh, when... Um, the, the movie Kickboxer came out with Van Damme. Well, Dennis Alexia was the brother in the wheelchair. Great athlete. And then I, of course, you know, the UFC, I worked every top fighter. Every one of them wanted me to wrap their hands and work their corners, you know. So if you give me a name, I'll give you a story. 
sure. uh, in, in boxing. My coming out fight, was, well, my first world title fight was with Tony the Tiger Lopez from Sacramento, California. Oh, okay. He fought Julio Cesar Chavez in Monterey, Bay, uh, Monterey, Mexico, in a baseball stadium. I mean, what a way for me to start my career. Yeah, that's, 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 quite, a, that's quite a big, yeah. big fight. And then my coming out party was uh, in Las Vegas with uh, Raul Marcus fought Keith Mullins. Oh, wow. Raul ended up with five cuts. Cuts all over. Here, here, and here. And sure. He was the IBF middleweight champ, and he defended his title, something like 70 stitches. Yeah. And uh, Chuck Bodak, that's when he came up to me and yeah. welcomed me into boxing. Wait, let me, I'm curious, though, because, like, we see guys get cut all the time. Yeah. And let's talk about where a cut is a problem. Because cause that's, that's when you yes. have a guy with five cuts, you, you, again, you've got 50 seconds at best, okay, to get in there. Because there's 10 seconds, you know, yep. seconds out, you've got you to start getting out of there. Right. So you, you don't have a ton of time. So you need to go to what's important. First. 100%. So is something in the vision that, that stops the vision? Yes. So where on the eye do you think is a cut the most problematic? Uh, well, you know, and that's a good point. Where Raul Marcus, these were my priorities. Sure. Right? I mean, it, were they over the eyebrow? They, they were right on the eyebrow. On the eyebrow. <laughs> right there. And they're about, you know, they're big cuts. Gnarly. Yeah, they're, they're, and, and uh, that was my priority. The other three, you know, you clean them up. You, you clean them up. You, you, yeah. you, you uh, apply adrenaline. Uh, but uh, yeah, Tyson Fury, you know, when he got cut coming up to his last fight or his next fight uh, with Usyk, I've done like 30 interviews and people ask me, well, what would you think about that? That's why, you know, that cut right there, he, his eyes are open, so he opened it up, but it's not really that bad of a cut. It's easy to control because the blood will come down sure. to the side. But as thin as it is, is it's, it's controllable. But, you know, during the fight, um, if he was to get cut, that type of cut in the fight, it's not that bad. They, they probably wouldn't stop it. But this cut right there, that big vein, yeah. that Badu Jack got, oh. that, that uh, uh, Vladimir Klitschko got, you pop that vein, you can't stop it. You can't stop it. No, Jay Haran fought Jonathan Goulet when I was uh, in the UFC, and he popped that, blood, that, that cut. Bloodiest fight I ever worked in my life. Yeah. It was so bloody that I got nauseated. From the iron? <laughs> From the iron, Oof. yeah. That smell, I've been in the ring yeah. after some rough fights. Yeah. It's a really distinct smell, the yeah. smell of iron. Yeah, so that, that Matt is in Randy Couture's gym in Las Vegas, <laughs> and Jay Haran is, is, is so proud of it. Because he's a, he's the, wearing the badge of honor. Oh, uh, the badge of honor. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. But that's another thing that sometimes cut, cut people do is the, with the sponge. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and t- tell us about the sponge, why yeah. you don't use the sponge. It's horrible because, you know, uh, the sponge, if, especially if you use it time after time after time, now I'm working on you and you got your blood in this. The blood's still going to stay within sure. the sponge, right? And, but in the, in the, the Creed 3 movie, they, somehow somebody decided to get the sponge and do this, right? And I'm working on Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> and right in the face. I, all over the face and I'm going like this. <laughs> and, and, and the, ca- oh, the, the cameraman's laughing and, <laughs> and I said, no, 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 that, that, yeah. that doesn't work. That's not going to work. So, but yeah, the sponge is horrible. Yo, I've seen, and I'm sure you've probably seen this too, but I've seen, only in Muay Thai I've seen it, where um, a corner guy will get up and jump in and spit water in his fighter's face. Horrible. Seen it. Horrible. Uh, me seen too. It. Me too. That's, that's a standard in Thailand. Seen it. Why, I don't know. Yeah. You know. Seen it. Get yeah. Up. Horrible. Spitting water. Horrible. Yeah, man. How my wife wouldn't kiss me if they did that to me. <laughs> you know, so it's horrible. Yeah. Now, when a cut, when a cut is, is, it's worse when a cut is jagged. Is that correct? Yeah. Or when it's straight. What I call a lightning bolt type of cut. That's usually created a lot from headbutts. Okay. Or elbows or sure. something like that. Because sure. it just, it goes in different angles. And that's, it's a lot that's, harder. That's a problem. Because if you got a cut like Tyson Fury's, it's easy just to keep it's it close and, and, and it'll stay close. Yeah. But when you got, what I call the, the a star lightning bolt cut at the different angles. Now another thing you're not afraid of. Oh, you've done your you've done your work pretty good, is Robin the, Press. Is the oh god, it yeah. swabs up the yeah. nostrils. I know we've all, we've all seen this in fights. Yeah. Oh. Talk, talk about that. For yeah, me. you see, guys, and you know, let me add that in this game, none of us trainers, cutmen, none of us have to be certified to be called professionals. So guys learn from looking at other people. But that swab, you get the guys put the swab in there, and they rotate it like. I don't know why, like they're churning butter. It's horrible. Well, you put the adrenaline chloride and then you just put direct pressure. Sure. It's that same theory of 
Right. You know, direct pressure. When you, when you used to get a nosebleed when you're a kid, you yeah. put your head back and you squeeze it. You don't get up there. And <laughs> no. It's like a COVID test. I think we're all pretty familiar with <laughs> Yeah, with I think we are. Yeah, I've been there and done Especially that. Especially us because we traveled yeah. during that. Yeah, been got there COVID, and done got that. a million COVID tests. That yeah. was not fun. Yeah. Um, amazing stuff, brother. Amazing stuff. Um, I told you it's crazy, man. Yeah. But, uh, and, and you were talking about the people that from that movie and in the Hall of Fame, but you're, you're coming into two Halls of Fame now, the National Boxing Hall of yeah. Fame and also Las Vegas. Yes. Yeah, and on Nevada. Yeah, it, Nevada. Uh, I got a call from uh, Linda Dempsey that uh, I was nominated to be selected into the Hall of Fame and uh, for the National Boxing Hall of Fame. And uh, that to me, that was a big honor, right? And they're filming a documentary in my life. First, I wrote a book called From the Fields to the Garden. The fields where I was a farm worker and the garden was Madison, Madison Square, Square Garden. Garden yeah. So that became very popular. It's on Amazon, by the way. Uh, but Gerald Roxburgh called me, the producer, and said, I'd love to do a documentary on you. And I told him about that. So when I signed with him, by the grace of God, Triple G was fighting. At that time, I was working with Triple G. He was fighting of all places, the garden. So you guys gave us all access. Uh, the garden gave us all access. Triple G gave us all access. So we got the footage there and then COVID kicked in. Yeah. And it put us on hold for a while and, and we came back and first guy we interviewed was Tyson Fury and you saw the trailer. And uh, so we're almost done with it, thank God. So my fin our final day of filming will be April the 28th when I get inducted into the National Boxing Hall of Fame. So they give us the opportunity to film that event. I love it, man. It's yeah. so, so well deserved. You're yeah. such a gentleman. and. You know, I'll tell you, it, you're just a great example of a guy that does what he loves. You, you, you're an honest guy, you're a hardworking guy, and you've always treated everyone, you treat everyone with respect and, and good things come to you, and I love that. Yeah. All right, look, let's do this. We, we always do um, something called fan questions. Are you okay? Sure, sure, of course, yeah, of course, yeah, of course, man. All right, let me grab the sheet. Yeah, of course. And see what we got here. Oh, well, I can read this. Okay, let's see here. Oh, here we go, fan questions, beautiful. Mm. Okay. Benji Hawkins asks, what's the worst cut you've ever had to work on? Well, uh, multiple cuts, uh, but Raul Marcus with the five cuts, yeah. that, that, was, that was quite multiple. Uh, but uh, Forrest Griffith, when I was with the UFC, uh, got that same kind of cut. In fact, sure. it's in a video game now. And uh, I used everything that I had, the adrenaline chloride 1-1000, the Avatine, and I, he ended up winning the fight. And uh, that was a good time for me so uh big ones out there uh Robbie Lawler in the UFC lip is just oh, sliced. That, that was terrible yeah it was just sliced oh, and that lip it looked like someone cut it yeah yeah literally like you got a razor and just cut it in half you and know what, and didn't someone say like don't smile and I, he was I, said, like, I, I, I said don't and you go but this blood just <laughs> just spits out oh it's but, terrible but but what was cool is Robbie got inducted that fight with Roy McDonald got inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame yeah He's, and I've been gone for 14, 15 years at that time. He gets on the page and he says, and I want to thank Stitch Duran for keeping me in the game. Everybody started clapping, you know, because the UFC had let me go at that point. Yeah. So they, he didn't forget, which That's is kind of nice. That's yeah. great. Do you remember the, the fight when um, Edwin Valero was down in uh, Mexico? He fought, um, oh God, I'm forgetting. His, his head was split wide open. Yes, yes. And he didn't even flinch. Yeah. And I don't think he had a great cut man in the corner. Yeah. It was just that guy was on a different. To some guys are just built different, man. I, I saw him spar in Las Vegas, and he dropped guys. Unbelievable. You know, on he dro dropped them like gunny sex. He was he was a beast. Yeah, Edwin Valero. My God. All right, but that was a terrible cut. Yeah, it was terrible cut. Julian Henderson asks, "Have you ever had two of your fighters square off? What did you do? I know recently Russ Anber was in between Better Beev and Smith, and totally missed the show." Yeah, you know, I've, that's a good question. Uh, in the UFC, it happens all the time. I could be wrapping your hands and uh, working this one fighters. You know, they understand. Vitor Balfort said it best. He goes, when I see Stitch walking into the dressing room, even though I know he's working in the other corner, he brings that calming effect. Mm. You know, Frank Mir says, you know, when I see Stitch coming into the dressing room to wrap my hands, I know it's time to fight. You know, so yeah, good question. So what's the answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, it, it, I mean, well, has, it, has it happened to you? No, you, no, you know, you just, no, thank God in, in, in boxing it hasn't happened. Okay. You know, we're two sure, guys. Sure. But I, I think I would do what Russ would do just is step out. aside, yeah, yeah, you know, and recommend quality cut men. Yeah. And are I've you, done that. Are you pals with Russ? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. You know. Yeah, he's, he's a good buddy of mine. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's been on the podcast also. 
great yeah. guy. And cut man and hand wrapper also. Yes. So, okay. Um, but let me, let me ask with Russ, when uh, Smith fought Betty Biev, he's watching me wrap hands. And, and I, when you got big knuckles, I'll put a cotton filter here. Okay. He made me take it off. But I understand. He's looking for the... It's part of the game. It's part of the game. It's part of the and game. And I respect so, him for that. So, so I'm glad you just brought that up because yeah. that's another thing. It's not just about wrapping hands, but on, there's so much involved in, a bit, in when, it, when the fight gets to a, a, a large level. Mm -hmm. Do you go to your opponents and watch their hands get wrapped? I, I did. Uh, normally, you know, working with Andre Ward, they would always send someone else. But when he fought Kovalev, I'm wrapping his hands. He goes, Stitch, I want you to go and check them. Sure. First time he's ever done that. So I go into Kovalev's uh, dressing room, and John David Jackson is wrapping his hands, and they're already having their issues, right? So I'm looking at this, and I guess John David Jackson's putting too much wrap, and but he just, Kovalev just starts taking it off and doing his own. So I look at, boom, kink number one. Right. And then Tony Weeks, the referee, comes in and says, uh, OK, you know, you guys have any questions? Like, Excuse me. And he says, yeah, you know, Andre comes in with his shoulder and this and that. It's OK, cool. Number two. You know, so those are little kinks in the armor. So I go back to uh, to uh, Andre and Virgil, uh, Virgil Hunter and I and I snitch on them. I said, look, man, here's what I saw. But that's the stitch, unfair. Stitch went to snitch. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was the first time I ever snitched, man. But, but that's, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. You know, and you look at those little uh, disadvantages. And then even the gloves, the gloves, because there was too much padding, right. that they had to go to ringside to get the second pair of gloves. And now, those are three. But are you the one that's in charge of checking that stuff for your fighter? No, no, no. Normally they'll send somebody else. Send somebody you know, else. yeah. Okay. I mean, if it, I have gone. Yeah. And in fact, when... Uh, uh, David Benavides fought uh, Caleb Plant. I, I, they sent me into the dressing room, and, and I've known David and Jose and, and the father. In fact, 10 years before, when we were in the UFC, we were in London, yeah. and I, his father says, you know, I have two sons. They're both going to be world champions. You know, how many times you hear that? You know, so I, I went in there, and I guess the father looked at me, and he got a little nervous, you know, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. Oh, man, fuck you, man, and, you know, that, that position, right? At the end of the fight, he apologized, you know, but he understood that that's, you look at those little kinks in the armor. You have a great relationship with your fight. Caleb Plant, he's a special guy to you, too. Yeah, right? I love Caleb, man, yeah. I love them all, man. They're, you know, it, it's many, many times when you get a kiss from these guys and tell you they love you, you know, and, and that's just so nice. And during the fight, it's not just about, let's say, all these things we've talked about, but it's also about looking at the fighter, yes. right? Yes. Being in their eyes and seeing what's happening. Yeah. Talk to talk about that. For yeah, a second. you know, and uh, it's it's important. You know, the eye contact. John Cepeda. I was talking to his brother Renee, and the last fight that he had, his brother had made a comment, and he didn't really absorb it until I brought it out. You saw that he did. I, I saw it, and it it changed his whole. We were talking about it yesterday. Changed his whole way of thinking. That you know had a <laughs> had Drago in the UFC fought uh, Matt Brown and. Uh, he was getting beat up and the referee stopped it and the doctor's looking at him and the referee, he's arguing with him, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I come up to him, I said, Drago, look at me. You got knocked out. He says, Stitch, Stitch, I believe. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so those, are, those are classic moments, bro. You know, oh, and they're, they're priceless. Okay, the last fan question here is from at djohnk82. He asks, what does Vaseline actually do? Is it just for the punches to slip off the fighter's head? Wow, that's a good question. And, you know, I've always thought this. Vaseline is being used. The theory is that the punches will slide off. But if that really was the case, we wouldn't need cut men. You know, so it, it does help to a certain point. But if you're going to get hit and you're going to get cut, you know, Vaseline's not going to help you. You know, can you do it? Vladimir Klitschko used cocoa butter. And he used cocoa butter only because the Vaseline would absorb into your, uh, your skin. And, you know, sometimes you get into pimples and all that. So... You want to keep his face nice. Yeah, yeah. A good yeah. complexion. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's, really you can do without it. Okay. What about, what's the whole thing about people talk about with Cutman crazy glue? Is that, is that? Wow. Yeah, that's, you know, that's what I'm saying. Nobody has to be certified, you know. <laughs> uh, Burns Benistein fought, I think uh, he, uh, I can't remember who was working. He was fighting Pacquiao. Oh, uh, Manuel. And uh, he used, it looked like uh, silly string. And he goes and he puts it in the cut, and all of a sudden he pulls it out, and I'm thinking, what kind of shit is that? Don't make sense, right? <laughs> Somebody must have said, oh yeah, do this, right. it works great. Uh, when I worked with Diego Corrales, 
on the second Jose Luis Castillo fight, right? And uh, this one guy in the corner comes up and says, hey, man, here we go. This could stop a bullet. And I looked at it. I said, I'm not going to use that. I don't even know what it is. You know, it was black. It was on the swab. And I, you know, I said, I'm not going to use that. That's, that's crazy. You didn't even know what it was? No. I think it was silver nitrate or something like that, which is unauthorized, right? And uh, so, yeah, <laughs> moments like that happen So the, the crazy time. glue is, is Crazy that. glue. So there's, yeah, it's, it's stupid. You know, people, and but guys have used it. They have used it, and there was a guy in Brazil that fought, and his trainer, cut man, whatever, used crazy glue, and it closed his eye to the point where they had to take him to the hospital. <laughs> it's, it's stupid. It's stupid, stupid, stupid. I just can't understand why people, but, you know, they, they have their own mentalities that this is going to work, and let's do this, and that's not the facts. Man, unbelievable. It's just so great talking to you. And we've only scratched the surface. Uh, yeah. This is an amazing guy. You know, yeah. we could talk for hours. But, um, you know, we have a great fight this Saturday. Yeah. Uh, Dalton Smith, Jose Chan, Cepeda. You're in the corner of uh, Cepeda. Yes. Um, it's a really exciting fight. It's going to be on the zone. So I hope you guys tune in. We're here in Sheffield, England. And until next time, thank you so much, Jacob Stitch Duran. Appreciate you. Always brother. a pleasure, bro. All right.